Welcome back to EE Vitron. This is episode 3. In today's episode I'm going to discuss how to solve problems numerically that would be too hard to be solved analytically. Um, and we are looking at uh, this little example problem here. That's the problem I'm going to solve. Um, so we have a conductive sheet here and the sheet conductivity is 2.9 kilo siemens and uh, we are going to discuss what this means um, in a second and um, we are forcing a current uh, into this sheet so the current enters the sheet here somehow travels to this point and then leaves the sheet again um, the current is 100 milliamps and the question we ask is what is the voltage between those, these two points and that's a problem that um, at least I think it's very hard to solve analytically. If you have an analytical solution to it, um, please leave uh, a comment. Um, but we are going to solve this problem numerically. And the nice thing about solving such a problem numerically is that once you have written the software to solve this category of problems, you can instantaneously apply the software to eat to, to any other geometry. So uh, if this would not be such a simple uh, geometry but something like a PCB with uh, complicated traces um, and whatnot, um, you could use exactly the same solution uh, and apply it uh, to this these other problems. Okay, so uh, let's talk about this uh, problem in more detail so we understand uh, what the question is and then we are going to look um, at the numerical solution. So let's talk a little bit about uh, conductivity and sheet conductivity. I'm, I assume you are uh, familiar with Ohm's law, so the voltage uh, equals the resistance times the current. Uh, and conductivity, uh, usually we use the letter G for conductivity. Conductivity is just the reciprocal value of the resistance. So G equals 1 over R. Um, and uh, that means uh, I can reformulate Ohm's law like this. So now the uh, current is just the conductivity times um, the voltage. So there is really nothing inherently to gain by using conductivity in, instead of resistance. In, um, in some cases it's little bit confusing to use conductivity because we are usually used to, uh, to use uh, resistance and to make calculations with resistance but um, in some cases it's easier to use uh, conductivity um, especially if we want to include the extreme cases so an insulator, perfect insulator can easily be expressed with uh, conductivity because it simply has conductivity of zero on the other hand um, a perfect conductor can easily be expressed with resistance because it has resistance zero. Uh, and zero is something we can do calculations with. So if we have um, an ideal conductor with resistance zero, we can immediately see from this version of Ohm's law that no matter how large the current is, we never need any voltage to force the current to an um, ideal conductor. Um, on the other hand, if we have uh, conductivity G and we have a perfect insulator with conductivity zero we can see here that how matter uh, how large the voltage is we will never be able to force a current through the conductor because we multiply it with uh, zero uh, conductivity. So the uh, SE unit of conductivity is the Siemens and one Siemens or one S is just uh, one over one ohm. Um, but sometimes, because of this relationship that is just the reciprocal value of the ohm, uh, the uh, Siemens is sometimes also called the Mo, which is just ohm reverse. And then uh, the symbol of a um, mirrored omega is used um, for, for the Mo. Um, but this is just uh, uh, for completeness. In, uh, in these slides, I'm always going to use uh, the Siemens as a unit for conductivity. So now we have a basic idea of what conductivity is, so let's move on and look at the sheet conductivity. So if I have a rectangular trace, like uh, this one here, um, then the conductivity increases with the width of the trace. So if I have a wider trace, um, it conducts electricity better 
and if I have a trace that is twice the size, it has twice the conductivity. Um, on the other hand, the conductivity is uh, indirect proportional to the length of the uh, trace. So if you have a, a trace with twice the length, it will have half the conductivity. So the sheet conductivity of a material is just the conductivity of any square piece of this material. So as long as the width and the length is the same, it doesn't matter how big the material actually is. Um, if the material doesn't change, if it has, still has the same thickness and uh, it's made of the same metal, it will have the same conductivity as long as it's square. So we take the conductivity of such a square piece and we call it sigma, the sheet conductivity. If you want to figure out the conductivity of any rectangle with width w and length l, we simply multiply the sheet conductivity with the width and divide it by the length and then we get the conductivity of this trace, of this square piece of metal. So let's have a second look at the problem we want to calculate. Uh, you see that we don't have any dimensions here. Uh, we just have a grid, but it doesn't matter if uh, these are centimeters or meters or inches or whatever. If we would build two versions of this with the same sheet material, so I don't change this 2.9 kilo Siemens uh, sheet conductivity. If I build a one meter by one meter version of it and the uh, uh, 10 centimeter by a 10 centimeter version and a one kilometer by one kilometer version or one mile by one mile version, it really doesn't matter. Um, it, I will always measure the same voltage here if I apply uh, this current. Um, so that's a wonderful thing. So we only need to know the, uh, the sheet conductivity and we need to know the relative measurements of uh, of this geometry but we don't need to know the the absolute measures um, and you will also see in the in the in the program code later on uh, that in the program code we we don't use any real world uh, length measures that we will we'll never have to uh, to tell the program what is the actual dimension here we just need to know the the relative geometry so the program we're going to write will calculate something like this here. Um, so that's our problem again uh, and we insert the current here and the current leaves the surface uh, on this other point here. Um, and the colors, they show uh, the, uh, the electrical potential on all the different points. So you could also say the, the voltage with respect to some arbitrary point like let's say this, let's say this is the ground point, then it's the voltage to this point. The two black uh, dots, these are the points we are interested in. So after the program will have calculated this, it will just measure the difference between these two points um, and this will give us um, our result. So um, how do we get to a picture like, like this one? Um, the basic idea is pretty simple. We first divide the surface uh, into a uh, small, in this case, rectangular cells. Um, and the idea is that there are so many that uh, it doesn't matter that we are not really looking at a continuous surface, but instead um, of uh, a surface that um, is constructed of small pixels. So I think the idea of a pixel is pretty good. Um, because uh, like with a digital photograph where you want uh, to have so many pixels that you don't see the individual pixels anymore, uh, you also want to have uh, so many cells here so that you don't really see the individual cells anymore but uh, have the impression of one continuous um, surface. Once we've done this, once we've divided the surface into cells, we need to find a way to uh, describe a single cell and we need to describe it in a way so that we know how to calculate a single cell. And if we know how to calculate a single cell, we also know how to calculate, in this case, 200 of 200 cells. So this would be 40,000 cells. Um, but of course, you wouldn't calculate something like this by hand, but uh, we have a computer and for the computer, in fact, this is a pretty small prob uh, problem. So we can um, easily use uh, a programming environment like Python uh, to get uh, 
the results. If we would have a much higher resolution, we might look into some different solutions um, that uh, uh, provide a better performance than Python does. So let's have a look at this individual cells. Um, here we see uh, the, the grid of the cells. So um, this rectangle here in the middle is one of those cells. Um, and for each cell we have a node potential. Um, so this is uh, U5. And probably it should be something like E5, but I really like to, to always use U uh, for potentials as well as for voltages. Um, and this point here is then connected to uh, to its four neighbor cells um, using uh, a resistor. Or in fact, it's a serious combination of two resistors. It's one resistor for the cell 5 itself and then one resistor for the neighboring cell. We will look at the formula to um, calculate the conductance between um, two of those neighboring points a little bit later. So for now, let's just say uh, it's the conductance, for example, G12 or G12 um, for the path between uh, U1 and U2. Uh, then the current that goes through this path is just the difference of these two potentials, U1 minus uh, U2, multiplied by the conductance of this path. So if you look at any of these points, for example, U5 here, then all the current that flows into this point might also flow away from this point. This is called Kirchhoff's current law. Uh, and we just use this law to create one equation for each of those points. So, uh, for example, for U5, we simply say the current that goes from U2 to U5 plus the current that goes from U4 to U5 plus the current that goes from U6 to U5 plus the current that goes from u8 to u5, the sum of all these currents must be zero. So it means if there is a positive current from u2 going to u5, then there must be a negative current either from u5 to u4 or from u5 to u6 or from u5 to u8 to compensate for this current going into the point. Uh, but we can't accumulate charge anywhere here. and. Uh, Therefore, there must always be an equilibrium between the current floating into a point and the current floating um, away from it. So for each point in our grid, for each cell, um, we create a variable and that's the potential of this point. And then we create an equation in this form. And the nice thing about this equation is that it's actually a linear equation in all the U's because we look at the geometry and from this we determine all the g's. So all the g's are constant. And if we multiply out this uh, equation, then we get something like this. u5 multiplied by a constant and u2 multiplied by a constant minus u4 multiplied by a constant minus u6 multiplied by a constant minus u8 multiplied by a constant equals zero. So this is a linear equation because we have our variables and each variable is just multiplied with a constant. So now we have a simple model of the conductive surface, but we also need uh, to create the model for the source that puts current through the surface. Um, and there are two ways of adding sources to this kind of, uh, of setup. Um, the first way is to set, um, the, set some cells to a fixed potential. Um, and that's the easy way, uh, but it has some limits because this basically means that we create voltage sources to some kind of universal ground point. Um, if we look at the uh, equation for U5 from before, then we have this equation here. Uh, but if we want to force U5 to, to be just one voltage, um, then we can simply replace the whole equation but it's much simpler equation and add the equation u5 equals 10, for example, if I want to force this point um, to 10 volts. Um, we need to do something like this for at least one cell so we have a reference for all the, the potentials. Uh, so usually we set at least one cell uh, like this to zero and then we know are all the other um, uh, cell potentials uh, voltages uh, with, with, with respect to um, to this point that we set to zero. 
It's also possible to create real sources, so arbitrary two terminal voltage and current sources. Um, this would uh, require the addition of one additional variable for each of these sources and because we actually don't need to do this to solve our simple problem, I leave it as a homework exercise to figure out how to do that. So let's finally have a look at the um, calculation of these edge conductances here, like G12 for the conductance for the path of uh, 0.1 to 0.2. Um, and let's do that by uh, first just looking at horizontal currents. Um, so if I have a horizontal current through this uh, configuration, we won't have any current through this vertical resistors. Um, and the current for this cell here would just go through these two resistors. So basically, because of this, we know that the conductance of one of those resistors must be half of the conductance of this uh, square rectangle. So as long as uh, the um, so as long as the sheet conductance is the same everywhere. Each of these resistors will have a conductance of uh, G half or sigma half because we used sigma for our sheet conductance. However, if uh, this cell 5, for example, and this cell 6 have a different conductance, then we have a serious circuit of two different resistors here. Um, and in our configuration, this could be the case for. Uh, a resistor that connects to an isolating cell, a cell that has a conductance of zero. So in the general case, we calculate the uh, conductivity uh, G12 or G21 from uh, the two individual conductivities uh, G1 and G2 for these neighboring squares using this formula. And this formula is just the formula for the serial circuit of uh, these two uh, resistors, each having half of the sheet conductance as conductance. Um, just a sanity check, we could look at the uh, uh, two simple cases. Uh, the first case being when one of the uh, two uh, conductances is zero, then we would expect uh, zero for the serial uh, configuration, of course. And we see here immediately if G1 or G2 is zero, then this product will be zero and it doesn't matter what we divide it with, uh, the resultant conductance will be zero. So the other thing we want to check is the case that both conductances uh, G1 and G2 are the same. And in this case, we would expect the uh, conductance for the uh, path to be also the same because uh, uh, if we look back here, it, if the conductance here is all the same and we look at the horizontal current, it doesn't matter if we look at the point path from here to here or the path from here to here. And we know that the path from here to here will be just our G and because this is the same G, we would expect the same thing here. So if G1 and G2 are uh, identical, then uh, we would have 2G here and then we would um, cancel out the first 2G with the uh, 2G at the bottom and would be just left with, uh, with a G. So both sanity checks work out um, and we know our formula for um, calculating the edge conductant, uh, conductance between two nodes. So theoretically uh, we know everything we need to know to solve this problem. We just create this grid with 200 times 200 is 40,000 cells. For each cell we create a variable and an equation. So we have a system of 40,000 equations and 40,000 variables um, and we could solve this, at least theoretically. But uh, for practical purposes such a huge equation system with 40,000 equations um, is, is a little bit tricky to solve. Um, but we can do it very easily using matrix math or linear algebra. Uh, so in the next three slides I want to give you a really really short introduction to the part of, of matrix math or linear algebra that you need to do such a thing. So let's consider this simple system of linear equations. Um, in this case B1, B2 and B3 
are our three variables and the a's and the y's they are all constants. So the first equation is just b1 multiplied with a constant plus b2 multiplied with a constant plus b3 multiplied with a constant equals another constant. And we have something like this three times and all the changes from equation to equation are the constants on the right hand side and all the constants um, in the left part here. So in linear algebra we can write this this kind of equation much more simpler we just write a times b equals y. Um, so this looks like a really simple equation, equation with just one variable if b is the, uh, the, the unknown again. Uh, but in fact a is not uh, a single variable here. a is a so-called matrix and that's just a table of all these a values here. Uh, and b's and y are both vectors. So there are a list of the values for all the b's and a list of the values for all the y's. And uh, with uh, linear algebra I can actually solve such an equation uh, and I give it the a, the uh, table for all these a values, the, the y, the list of these y values um, and get out my list of b values. So that's exactly the kind of tool we want to have for our problem. Uh, because we have a problem uh, where we can describe it using a large system of linear equations um, and want to use the computer to solve it and because we have linear algebra we can uh, do it easily using a linear algebra library. There is only one problem. In our case uh, we have 40,000 40, uh, variables and 40,000 equations. So this table here would be 40,000 times 40,000 long. And 40,000 times 40,000 is 1.6 billions. So this is a really, really large, num large number. Um, but we are lucky. In our case, most of these uh, A's are not used. There, or we can also write them as zero. So if we have a system like this one, where we don't use all the places in our A matrix, we call this kind of matrix a sparse matrix. Um, and there are special libraries for handling sparse matrices uh, where we only need to give it the numbers for the places in A that are actually used and because in our case we only need uh, five entries in each line we can get away with 200,000 uh, entries instead of 1.6 billion entries and 200,000 non-zero entries is not that much of a problem. So with matrix math we get uh, two things. Uh, the first thing we gain is a simple and compact way of describing huge mathematical problems like the one uh, we were looking at and the second one is uh, a set of libraries that can actually be used to calculate this stuff. Um, and that's the main reason why I want to use matrix math. So as you have seen in this example um, there is nothing really new to it. We could have used just 40,000 individual equations but using uh, this matrix notation it becomes much easier to uh, to handle this large number of equations and this large number of variables um, and that's uh, definitely an advantage. Um, however, uh, I have told you everything you need to know about uh, matrix math for this problem but that's, on, that's not even the tip of the iceberg. It's not the tip of the iceberg, it's not even the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more to learn about linear algebra and if you're really interested to learn more about it, um, I have two things I can recommend to you. Uh, the first one is uh, the Khan Academy. Uh, there's a whole set of uh, small videos on, on linear algebra uh, and it should cover everything you need to know to get started. Um, and if you're really serious about it, um, you could uh, go to the MIT Open Courseware um, web page and uh, download the MIT lectures on uh, linear algebra. They're read by Gilbert Strang and uh, uh, he's doing a really great job. So I can really recommend the, the MIT linear algebra um, lectures if you're interested in learning more about this. So I have written a small Python library to do this kind of um, calculations and before I show you the code of the library itself I thought I'd start with showing you the code of how to use the library um, and 
uh, we should start with a small example. So this is not the problem we want to um, to solve in the end, uh, but just a really small example using the three times three mesh. So when we use the, the library, we of course first need to import the library and the library is called DC mesh and it provides an, uh, a class DC mesh that can be used for solving this kind of stuff. So then I create my uh, solver object and uh, I just call DC mesh with the parameter 3.3 three, three, uh, to tell it my problem is three cells wide and uh, three cells height. Uh, then I have to set up the, the shape for my problem. Um, so initially um, all cells are set to a conductivity of zero um, and what we do here we set all cells to a conductivity of one with the exception of the center cell um, because this is a really easy thing to solve manually in your head and you will then see if the library actually uh, produces the, the same result that uh, we would get when we just think about the problem. Um, then we also need to set up uh, a voltage source uh, and this I do by setting the coordinate 0, 0 to 1 and uh, uh, setting the coordinate 2, 2 to 0. So these are the two points where I set the voltage and then the current will flow through the surface um, because of this, this voltage. And finally I will run the solver. Uh, this will then just solve the problem I just uh, set up and uh, when the solver returns I can uh, use the emshow function to display uh, the umap. So here above here I, I set voltages manually um, and the solver then sets all the other voltages that are necessary um, or that are the result of the, the current created by this initial voltages. Um, and then I just uh, display a nice color bar and also um, show uh, the results. I also output here uh, the total current that will flow through the surface. And this is the thing that we will uh, um, that we will solve uh, also manually to just check if the uh, solver does the right thing. So let's solve this problem manually first. So I'm re reusing this graphics from my uh, previous slide and uh, first of all we set all these cells here to one Siemens conductivity but not the center cell so the center cell uh, does not conduct at all. Then we set one corner to uh, a voltage of one volt and the other corner to a voltage of zero volt. So because the conductivity is always one Siemens, uh, this means that we have one ohm from, for, for each uh, edge resistances. So we have one ohm here, we have one ohm here, we have one ohm here and we have one ohm here. So this whole path here are four ohms. And the same thing for the other side. We have 1 ohm, 1 ohm, 1 ohm, 1 ohm. So the entire path has 4 ohms. So we have 4 ohms in parallel with 4 ohms. That gives us uh, 2 ohms in total. Um, where do I write it? So, 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 equals 2 ohms. And because I have a voltage of 1 volt, 1 volt over 2 ohms gives me half an amp. So This is what we expect to get from our simulation. Uh, let's see if it actually works. So let's run the program. Um, click and it's done. So it's really fast with the 3 times 3 problem. Uh, and we can see here it actually uh, got us the result we expected, uh, half an amp. And we also can see the uh, voltage distribution here and of course on the upper left corner we have our one volt point on the lower right uh, corner we have our zero uh, volt point uh, here in between we have exactly uh, 0.5 and then we have 0.75 up here this looks like the same color and uh, 0.25 uh, 
uh, this also looks like the same color here. So, so far uh, it looks like the library does exactly what it's supposed to do. Um, so let's have a look at the library itself. So this is now the Python code for my DC Mesh library. Um, and the first thing to note here is that I um, import the sparse function um, from sci-fi so I can use sparse matrix uh, math easily and don't need to implement all the uh, low-end functions for that um, on my own and uh, I also profit from the uh, speed optimized implementations um, they offer here. So this is my DC mesh uh, class First I have an init method, uh, where I simply uh, copy the width and height of the problem to internal variables and then create this conductivity map that we have seen before, where we, where, where we set um, all the, the cells with the exception of the middle cell to a conductivity of 1. I also initialize this voltage map, um, but I multiplied with none here, so in fact all the cells here are initialized with not a number, um, so that the solver can then see where the user wants to force a voltage. Then I have two helper functions. Um, so of course it's easier in many places to address the individual cells using uh, two-dimensional co coordinates, so I have a y and an x coordinate. But we also know that the matrix we are going to create will be a 40,000 times 40,000 matrix. So um, I have uh, to have some way of uh, uh, converting an, a coordinate in the 200 by 200 grid uh, to a value from from zero to uh, uh, from from zero inclusive to less than uh, 40,000. Um, and this is done by, by this function and it's done the naive way, but if we would have a problem where we have huge gaps somewhere, uh, we could uh, modify this function to, uh, so that we don't create uh, extra variables for all these cells that are actually within the, the huge gap. Um, I also have a little method that I can use to check if a coordinate is actually a valid coordinate. This is used in the solver. Um, to correctly uh, create the equations for the cells that are on the edge of the 200 by 200 grid. Because for these cells, uh, if it's for example on the left edge, you can't uh, uh, create the, uh, the edge for the conductive path to the left neighbor because these cells, they don't have a left neighbor. So, and then I finally have my solver function itself. Um, this is on the next uh, page here. Within the solver function, I first need to create uh, the, the whole equation system. Uh, and because I'm using um, uh, compressed row sparse matrices here, uh, that's just, just a format to store these sparse matrices, I don't have just one variable for my matrix A, but instead I, I have this block of vari variables that I first create up here. Um, and then in this uh, cascaded for loops, I initialize them. So here I set up my, my whole equation system. Um, and this is basically done in three steps for each cell. Uh, first, we uh, read some, 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 some information we need to, um, um, to, to create the, the equation for this cell and stuff like that. Um, then I check if the uh, this cell has an entry in the U map, that is the potential map, and if it has an uh, entry, I simply create this, this, this simple equation where I just set the variable for this cell to a fixed value. Uh, that's the thing we, um, we've seen in the creating voltage sources and current sources uh, slide. And if this entry has, this cell has not an entry in the U map, it basically means that uh, the, the solver should uh, calculate the voltage for that. And then I have this larger block here uh, that simply creates the equations for, for that. Um, so after that, we have a second block here uh, where we actually solve the system. Um, 
So in the first step, we now use all this, uh, these variables uh, I initialized uh, before. It's a, it's a two line comment for some reason the indenting um, uh, got uh, got screwed up here, uh, but this is one comment. Um, so uh, here now I create a variable a, and now I have this sparse matrix as variable a, and then I could can simply use this uh, function call here uh, to the sparse linear algebra library to solve this uh, this system uh, a times uh, uh, u equals b. Um, so now we uh, know all the voltages for for the individual points. So this u is our vector with 40,000 elements where we have the potential for each individual cell. So after that we have uh, one one more block where we basically determine the current that is uh, um, delivered by the this global voltage source uh, and we simply do that by first initializing the total current to zero and then going over all the individual cells and check if the cell is a cell that has actually an externally forced voltage and if so we look at the uh, um, voltage between this cell and its neighbor cells and also at the resistances um, and from this calculate the uh, individual currents and just add them to the to the total current here. Yeah. And then when we are done with that we update the uh, UMAP variable. So this is continuing here um, using the uh, the values from the UMAP uh, from the U vector. So for each entry in this XY uh, grid of cells, we look up the uh, the the element in the U vector and just copy it over to the UMAP. So now we have in the UMAP not only the uh, entries that are set by the caller of this function um, to set up the problem, but also all the calculated uh, potentials for all the individual cell points. And finally, we also have a plot method that can be used to plot the results easily. By now, you might have asked yourself uh, the question, what about diagonal currents? So, so far, we only looked about uh, horizontal or vertical currents and said, okay, if a current is flowing horizontal here, then these two resistors, uh, they don't experience a voltage drop and therefore there will be no current and we can only look at these two resistors and see, okay, if these two resistors actually have uh, the conductivity G, uh, the same conductivity as the cell has, then this is a very good model. And the same thing here for the vertical current. There is no horizontal voltage, so therefore there is no current through the horizontal uh, vertical resistors. Um, all is flowing vertically, and if these two resistors here have the same conductance as the whole cell, then this is a good model for the uh, for this resistor. Um, and in our initial test case, we just uh, set the initial the the, uh, the center cell to a conductance of zero, and therefore we only had uh, currents that were flowing vertically or horizontally, and we could easily see what is going on. So the big question is, what is if we don't do this? What is if we have a diagonal current flowing here? Um, is this cell with the uh, two, uh, uh, two horizontal and two vertical resistors really a good model for this diagonal current? So there are two, two ways to, to answer this question. Um, the first one is the theoretical argument um, and it goes like this. Uh, we have a completely linear system, so a diagonal current could simply be seen as a superposition of a horizontal and a vertical current. So we only look at the vertical current and its effects, and we only look at the uh, um, we we'll look at the horizontal current and its effects, and only at the vertical current and, and its effects. And if we add these two currents, we get some current that is diagonal, and also the effect of this some diagonal current. Um, and so we can argue because of uh, uh, linearity and this superposition thing that if we have uh, the correct behavior for orthogonal current, so uh, horizontal and vertical, we also get the same correct results for diagonal currents. 
and there is only an also an experimental argument or a sanity check um, and I want to, to, to show you this here as well. Um, so the idea is we create a problem uh, that can be rotated easily um, and then we simply solve this problem and then we rotate it a little bit and solve it again and rotate it a little bit and solve it again and so on. And then we can compare the results uh, for the different orientations and see if the um, um, if the simulation does the right thing or if the simulation uh, produces huge errors when we rotate the whole setup by 45 degrees and then everything is flowing vertically that did flow horizontally before. So um, I'm not going to uh, to review the source code of this, uh, but you can of course uh, check it out online along with, with all the other sources, but instead I will um, show you the uh, the output of the program directly. Okay, so let me quickly uh, start this uh, second example program. Now this uh, creates some kind of trace um, with two points again where I enforce an external voltage, but then it rotates this trace in uh, 9 degree steps and each time it measures the current. Um, and we do this for a whole of 90 degrees, so at the end we will have 11 data points, including 0 degrees and 90 degrees. And we expect uh, to vary it a little, of course, because this is all numerically, and uh, we are not using a particularly high resolution here to simulate um, the, um, the setup. Um, but it shouldn't vary a lot, so it's done. Um, and here is the graph of the results. Um, and you see we always have a little bit more than um, 0.4 amps in this, uh, in this case. It wiggles a little bit, but it's not really a dramatic change uh, when we have the current flowing uh, orthogonally or diagonally through the resistor network. Um, so from this we can see experimentally that uh, our model also works for diagonal currents. We are almost there. There's just a little problem left. Um, in the problem we want to calculate, we actually have a current source um, injecting a current into the sheet. And uh, we left that out. We only talked about uh, uh, applying voltages. So what we have to do is we have to reformulate our problem. Um, and instead of forcing a current through the uh, surface, we just apply an arbitrary voltage. We could, for example, apply one volt. Um, of course, with the numbers we have, if you would really apply one volt, uh, we would have uh, an immense uh, current in the order of kilovolts. But this is just a simulation, so we can, without any problem, just apply one volt and after that uh, measure uh, in the order of kiloamps uh, current through the surface. And uh, then we read out the current that this one volt actually produced and then we can scale down our results so that the current is now uh, 100 uh, milliamps and with the scale down, scaled down results, so we scale down the current but we also scale down all the voltages, we can read out the, the voltage that we are interested in, namely the, the voltage that we would read here if we would have one, uh, 0.1 amp flowing here or 100 milliamps flowing here. So this is now the program that actually computes the results we were looking for. Um, of course, first we import my DC mesh module that I have shown you before. Then we set up the problem and we say it's a 200 by 200 cell problem. Um, we create the shape and that's just the um, shape that was uh, specified and we set the conductance to 2900 or uh, 2.9 kilo siemens and then we create voltage, voltage sources um, and uh, we don't only set one cell to the voltage, this would be bad because uh, then we would have very very uh, high resistance uh, near that, that point, instead we choose to um, 
to set the voltage um, on small rectangles that are in this case uh, 5 by 5 uh, cells or 5 by 5 pixels. Um, after that, when we've set up the problem, uh, we run the solver. When the solver returns, we read out the, uh, the current that was flowing. We also read out the voltage between the two points we were interested in. And then we just uh, calculate the current we were looking for by uh, scaling um, the results down. And uh, in the end, we also uh, plot the results um, just so we uh, can see what the, the voltage distribution um, looks like. Good, so let's run the program. And here it is, uh, the graphics I have shown you before, showing the, the voltage drop when the current flo is flowing from here to there. Uh, and here we can see the, the result that we were looking for. The voltage between these two points is uh, 0.033 millivolts or 33 microvolts. Um, or at least that's what we think it would be uh, from our simulation. Um, and just for the case that you don't believe me, I have actually uh, built the whole thing and we will hook it up to the power supply now and see if the simulation was right and if we really get 33 uh, microvolts out of this. So this is the test setup. We now have this, this shape that we were looking at uh, the whole time. Uh, current entering here and going back to the supplier there and these two terminals are from the uh, the multimeter and I uh, soldered on little uh, pins here so I could easily uh, connect the equipment. Um, I also have this little test strip here on the side that I initially used to measure the conductivity of this material uh, and that's where the 2.9 kilo siemens come from. So the leads for the power supply are of course connected to my bench power supply and the leads for the multimeter are connected to my bench multimeter. Um, so I've, uh, I've zeroed out the, um, the noise uh, but it seemed to have drifted a little bit so let me zero out it again. So I press relative one so now we see the noise as well and the noise is like 3 millivolts here um, but it's steady DC because I'm integrating over um, a couple of samples so press relative um, now we should get 0 millivolt here uh, uh, microvolt that's actually the microvolts and this is the decimal point for the millivolts and now let's uh, turn on the power supply on so now we get uh, about 100 milliamps through the circuit and if we look up at the uh, multimeter here we are 33.3 uh, microvolts so it looks like our simulation that predicted 33 microvolts was spot on the techniques I have just shown you apply to a broad field of applications uh, for all kinds of simulations, not, not, not even limited to electronics. Also in, in, in physics and other areas, you will use exactly these techniques to, to simulate all kinds of things. So I thought in this last slide I give you a brief overview of uh, what lies beyond uh, this, this simple example. Um, and the first thing would be smarter tessellations. So now we have used this, this regular grid, this, this checkerboard-like uh, layout, to divide our problem into small cells. Um, however, um, um, usually you don't use simple uh, tessellations like that one um, for 
a couple of reasons, but the most important reason is that you uh, want your tessellation to be finer in some places and coarse in other places. Because when you uh, simulate complex systems, you might not only have uh, uh, 40,000 cells like in our simple example, but, but millions of, of cells or uh, far beyond that number. So in order to keep computation time low, you uh, you always try to keep the number of cells low and one way of doing that is to uh, use only use such a fine resolution in places where you actually need it. Um, and usually when you have uh, uh, constraints like that, uh, you not uh, use rectangles anymore, you use triangles, they are in a way more generic and uh, better ways of, uh, of tessellating uh, an area uh, unevenly so that you have finer uh, tessellations at one place and coarse tessellation at other. So you use triangles for 2D problems or uh, tetrahedrons for 3D problems. Um, sometimes you even want to make this tessellation adaptive at runtime. So you at first run the, uh, the simulation with a really coarse tessellation uh, and then you look at where are the, 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 the fast changes in my, my values uh, and then you uh, change the tessellation there, make it more fine uh, and then rerun the simulation um, um, so you get a better resolution at these places that are actually interesting. Then of course you could use uh, uh, the stuff I have told you about linear algebra. Um, also for, for non-geometric or non-uniform uh, problems like uh, circuit simulation. When you run a spice simulation of a, a large circuit, it basically uses uh, a similar technique to numerically solve um, the, the, the circuit you have described. And in this case, there is then no geometric interpretation of, of, of the variables, but they are um, yeah, just... Um, just point voltages in your circuit graph, for example, um, but without, uh, without this, this geometric um, information um, connected with it. And finally, of course, more complex math. We only used a simple linear problem here. And uh, um, first of all, you might get uh, uh, problems where you have more than one variable per cell. Uh, also problems where you have more than one parameter per cell. So with this example, we only had one variable per cell and the cell, uh, variable was the cell voltage and only one parameter was the conductivity, the sheet conductivity of this cell. Um, but when you're running stuff like uh, um, magnetic field solvers and so on, you might have a more complex set of parameters to describe the individual cells and also multiple values uh, for, for each cell. And then of course uh, there are a lot of problems where you use nonlinear models um, and then you use other techniques um, to like the Newton method um, to approximate the problem uh, for a specific set of, of, of values. So you first guess a solution, then you approximate the, uh, uh, the problem with a linear model for solution values around your guess. And then you use the linear solution to get a better uh, estimate, which is your new, new guess, um, and then, then you repeat. Uh, and that's a quite uh, common method used for simulations when you have nonlinear stuff like diodes in a, in a circuit and so on. Um, and then there are uh, even cases where you're not only solving um, um, a system of equations, but instead you want to integrate a set of differential equations, even in implicit or explicit form. Um, so uh, a common example for that would be when you want to uh, calculate the transient of something, so how something behaves over time, then you would use uh, integration with time as your integration variable. Thanks for watching this episode of EE Viton. That's all I have uh, for today. If you want to discuss it or leave a comment, uh, please jump over to Reddit. You will find a link to the Reddit thread in the description. Um, I will also upload all the files, that, uh, the presentation slides as well as the scripts to GitHub and you will also find a link to the GitHub repository in the description. Till next time, bye!